this is a, a good uh, pleasure for me to introduce uh, Antonio Linero, Tony. Uh, Tony is, uh, uh, works at the University of Texas uh, at Austin faculty from 2019. And he was an assistant professor uh, before at Florida State University. He's a member of International uh, Bayesian Society, uh, same as me, and of the American Statistical Association. Uh, uh, Antonio Linero has uh, some uh, imp uh, relevant papers in the field of the Bayesian regression tree. For example, an American Statistical Association journal, a Bayesian regression tree for high dimensional prediction on variable selection, or in the Royal Statistics Society, uh, Bayesian regression three ensembles that adapt to smoothness and sparsity. Uh, his research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, and uh, he works uh, in Bayesian non-parametrics for missing data and causal inference and other problems. Uh, again, it's a pleasure for me to introduce it, and the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, and thanks so much for uh, for inviting me. It's great to uh, uh, get to meet everybody. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about some some work that I've done with some collaborators on um, uh, Bayesian decision tree ensembling strategies for for non-parametric uh, for fully non-parametric problems. Um, I'd like to acknowledge some collaborators, a few uh, students at Florida State. I am. Piali Basaki and Puli, as well as some uh, faculty collaborators at UT Austin, FSU, uh, Harvard, and, and UIUC. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so just kind of jumping right into it, um, let's just consider a problem, you know, fairly basic, uh, basic uh, semi-parametric regression problem, right? You're given uh, data consisting of x1, y1 up to xn, yn. So uh, pairs of predict, uh, predictors and, and outcomes, um, and you posit some sort of um, semi-parametric uh, regression, right? So y is related to, to x through some uh, unknown uh, function f0 uh, with, say, Gaussian errors. And uh, the question is sort of how do you recover the relevant features of f0? So this is, you know, I think a problem uh, that doesn't require too much motivation, right? I think uh, the the appeal of doing some semi-parametric regression is well known. Um, it's relevant just in a couple of uh, areas in particular. Uh, machine learning, where you sort of um, are interested in predicting an outcome, and what you're what you're interested in getting in particular um, is a prediction. So you're kind of in, interested in doing predictive uh, inference, um, and then there's also causal inference which is qualitatively different in the sense that the function f0 is a uh, nuisance parameter, and maybe you're interested in estimating some sort of causal effect, but you have to do some smoothing, essentially, to account for um, confounders. And you're right, in the causal inference setting, the x's are going to be uh, confounding, uh, confounding variables. Um, I contrast with machine learning, where the function f0 itself is of interest. But you're interested in recovering relevant features, uh, whether that's predictions, it could be which variables are relevant, um, which which coordinates of x are relevant in predicting y, and, and so forth. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on on decision trees. Um, so decision trees are just a way of generating relatively flexible uh, predictions. Um, the idea is is not too not too difficult. I think if you see a picture, you sort of understand immediately what's going on. Um, this is probably a bad example for Spain because it, it uh, concerns American uh, an American sport, baseball. Um, but the idea uh, with this tree is to predict the salaries of, of baseball players in, in the United States um, based on various attributes that they have, so how many runs they score, whether they're a free agent. And you basically just check the rules and work your way down the tree. So I check this rule, I check if they're a free agent, and then I check if... Um, you know, they score more than 28, uh, 28 runs, and at the bottom I get a prediction. In this case, it's a prediction in, in thousands, of, uh, thousands of dollars. Um, it's a relatively old technology. Um, I think uh, 
going back all the way to the, the 1980s and perhaps uh, even earlier, but um, seminal work of, of Cass in 1980, constructing these things essentially using chi-square um, uh, chi square tests for finding optimal uh, splitting rules. Um, and then really popularized by Bryman and his, um, and his collaborators, they introduced the card algorithm and uh, Kinlan in 1993, the, the C4 algorithm, all just different algorithms for constructing uh, decision trees or fitting decision trees to data. Um, the, the idea, or there's an equivalence between uh, decision trees and step functions. Um, so in this case, I have a decision tree that takes as input two variables, x1 and x2. Um, the first one has a splitting rule, what I'll call a splitting rule, x1 less than or equal to 0 0.4. I go left if that's true and right if that is false. Um, and let's say it's true, then I get to another decision rule, x2 less than or equal to 0 0.7. I go left if true, right if false. And this maps to a partition of the predictor space. So if you give me a tree, um, a decision tree of this form, I can partition the uh, space of the, the covariates. And then the function that I end up estimating will just be a step function. And when I get to the bottom of the tree, these nodes here called the leaf nodes, um, the etas are the predictions that the tree uh, furnishes, so that, that we get from the tree. Um, but generally, it's been understood for a while that you usually don't want to fit a single decision tree. Well, one of the selling points of decision trees is that they're arguably more interpretable than other black box machine learning methods. Um, the problem is that they are not, not ideal for prediction. And you can improve their predictive performance by essentially combining a bunch of decision trees together. And well, you lose a little bit of the interpretability, but you can gain um, a lot in terms of, of prediction performance. Um, so Bryman introduced uh, the bagging algorithm, which is a uh, less developed version of the algorithm that people now use very often in practice of random forests. Um, the idea behind those is essentially to bootstrap your data uh, many times, and on each bootstrap resample, you fit a new decision tree, and then you average all of the results together. That's um, that's the main idea, and that has the function of essentially reducing the variance without uh, increasing the bias too much, and so it can uh, do quite a bit for improving your prediction uh, performance. Uh, or you can take a Bayesian viewpoint um, and think of the decision tree, right? So think of this decision tree as a parameter in a model. Um, I can be Bayesian, I can put a prior distribution on it, and I can try to infer the tree from the posterior distribution, right? It's a little bit, um, it's a little bit uh, off for Bayesians, and maybe you're used to thinking of parameters as being, you know, Euclidean parameters, nice, uh, smooth, um, smooth quantities taking, taking values in a continuum. Uh, here the parameter is this discrete object, the tree. But conceptually, there's no problem with that. And uh, so we can get a posterior, and we can learn uh, the tree structure, and then average over the posterior, essentially averaging over many different trees. Um, there is um, an alternate class of strategies that are based on combining weak learners. So for bagging random forest, Bayesian model averaging, the idea is that you grow a complete tree. A single tree on its own will do a good job of describing the data. Um, this notion of combining weak learners is rather than growing many deep trees that are good at describing the data, you, you grow relatively small trees. And each individual tree picks up a small amount of the signal. But when you combine them all together, you get, um, you get um, a large uh, part of the signal. Um, they're, they're strong in kind of aggregate, even though um, a single tree on its own won't do a very good job. Uh, this idea. Um, is maybe best associated to boosting algorithms. Um, the idea of boosting decision trees or boosting weak learners. Um, very widely used algorithm. And then the Bayesian take on boosting is, is BART. And that was introduced in this work of uh, Chipman and others in 2010. Um, and that's where we're going to uh, be dedicating our attention. Um, I'd say that out of these methods, the gold standard is probably 
um, the boosted decision trees algorithm. It still, to this day, wins um, you know, various machine learning competitions or Kaggle competitions. Uh, boosted decision trees uh, do very well um, sort of on, on the types of problems where, ne where neural networks are not ideal, boosted decision trees often work um, pretty well. Um, BART seems to perform just as well, if not better, than, than uh, boosting. Um, the reason it probably doesn't get uh, taken up in these sorts of things is it can be quite difficult to scale them. Um, what does it mean to add two trees together? Well, if I have a, as I said, you can associate to each uh, tree a partition of the predictor space. So I could, uh, this is say one tree, here's another tree. And if I add them together, it's sort of like overlaying them on transparencies. Um, so I end up with a new tree here where the quantities in each of these um, equivalence classes, now there's some information sharing, right? So I have mu one plus mu three, that's going to be correlated in the prior distribution with mu two plus mu three and mu one plus mu four. So there's sharing of information across uh, neighboring cells. Um, and because of that, when you do these decision tree ensembling, you generally get things that are approximately um, approximately smooth. Um, so the Bayesian additive regression trees approach, um, I represent my function f as a sum of many um, decision trees. Um, I put independent priors on each of the uh, each of the decision trees, and uh, I get a posterior. Do some Bayesian inference. The prior, uh, well, you can look at details for what the prior is on the trees um, in the uh, in this paper. Um, can you see when I highlight? I guess it's uh, I don't I don't really know what shows up on the screen or not. Yeah, it's fine, Anton. It's fine. We see it. Okay. Um, so. Um, this um, Bayesian additive regression trees have, have seen, I think, steadily increasing popularity um, over the last decade, um, partially because of their success in causal inference competitions that have been done. Um, it's seen a lot of uptake, uh, uptake in, um, in causal inference um, because um, essentially it's a very flexible model. It can deal with nonlinearities, and because it's Bayesian, it gives you uncertainty quantification. And the uncertainty quantification that you get out of it is somehow um, better than you would expect it to be. So when you cover, when you construct things like credible intervals, um, they won't cover at the nominal rates, but um, they will tend to cover better than even specifically constructed frequentist estimators. Um, so it's it's good for those two reasons, good uh, good as for model fitting and then uh, better uncertainty quantification than you might uh, than you might expect. Um, so why I sort of think this is an interesting tool, it's one, it's just highly flexible and it's it's very high quality. Um, it gives you some sense of principled uncertainty quantification, at least if you believe that Bayes is a uh, principle that gives you uh, some form of uncertainty quantification. And it's also very easy to use. So a lot of effort has gone into making packages that are um, that are easy for practitioners practitioners to use. This is probably the most important thing for why, uh, why people have started using it so much, is the high quality software packages that have been developed. Um, I'll give a slight digression on this. Um, um, notion of soft trees, because in reality, this is what I'm what I'm actually going to be using. Um, I'll talk as though I'm just using a regular bard, but really, in in the background, you'll know that I'm I'm really using a, a soft trees. So on the left here, you have a a soft uh, or rather a a standard decision tree uh, partitions the space and gives predictions, um, and you can do this process of softening it to induce smoothness um, in the regression function. So right, this is a discontinuous function on the left. Um, for various reasons, you might want your predictions to be smooth. It can often improve your prediction performance if the underlying truth is smooth. Um, so uh, we developed some technique for adding a bandwidth parameter that, uh, that smooths the trees, produces continuous estimators of the function of, of interest. Um, 
the details aren't too important, but just keep in mind that we're using these, uh, these soft trees uh, most of the time. Um, the, the effect is kind of seen in this figure where you have a standard fit from the BART model. And you can see it's relatively, you know, it's quite smooth. This is trying to fit a straight line on the top and on the bottom trying to fit a sine curve. Um, the fit of a regular BART model uh, looks continuous. Um, it's really kind of resembling a, a continuous nowhere differentiable function, um, which is intuition that, that can be, be made mathematically precise. Um, but uh, yeah, so not not as smooth as you might want it uh, might want it to be. And by introducing smoothing parameters, we can get these nice smooth functions. And you can see that it results in better prediction performance. That somehow smoothing, if your target uh, function is smooth, then by introducing smoothing, you'll you'll generally get a better estimate. Um, so I'll illustrate. Um, just to give an idea of how to actually use this, these things, uh, it's, it's very, really not so complicated to use it for semi-parametric regression. Um, this is a, a pretty standard uh, regression function that people um, use to test models. Um, it is nonlinear, so it has five relevant predictors. There's, there's nonlinearity through a sine function and a quadratic. Um, and there is an interaction term between x1 and x2. Um, x3 is a non-monotone function um, as well. Um, so just trying to recover this function, it, it's, there, there's enough going on to make the problem sort of interesting. Um, I wrote some code here basically just for generating data from this model. Um, the x's are uniform, um, independent uniform 0, 1. And, um, the y's will be normal, centered at uh, the mean plus some error. And um, we're allowing for the possibility of more than five predictors. So in this case, I generated um, data with 1,000 predictors. Only the first five are relevant. And um, so there's 995 variables that are, that are irrelevant that we would like to, to filter out. Um, Fitting models, I'm using a package that I have on, on GitHub. Um, it should be fairly easy to track down. It's, it's not on CRAN, but um, it's easy enough to find called SoftBart. Um, now, when you, when you think of, of you know, Bayesian models, you may worry, oh, there's, there's a lot of hyperparameters that you have to specify. Maybe it requires some expertise to actually get um, sensible prior distributions. Um, but a lot has gone of effort has gone into finding reasonable defaults that seem to work um, very well across a wide variety of um, of problems. So I very rarely actually think very hard about the hyperparameters that I specify. Um, there's a couple of helper functions in the package that will generate for you the hyperparameters. Uh, really, you only have to tell them the number of trees and um, let the software take care of the rest. Of course, if you want to change the hyperparameters, if you're an expert and you want to do that, that's not a, that's not a problem either. Um, then some uh, line here for basically uh, saying, giving the options for running the chain, how many samples you want to burn in, how many you want to save, and then just fitting the model. So plug in your X, Y, uh, a testing set, and uh, your hyperparameters, and it, um, runs on this problem fairly quickly. Um, once you have a fit, so I have a fit object here, there's a bunch of stuff in the fit. You know, it will contain predictions. It will contain, um, you know, the hyperparameters, log likelihood. You can, you can, you know, monitor the mixing of your chain and everything. Um, one thing you can get out of it is uh, posterior inclusion probabilities for each of the variables. Um, this is just one of many things that you could that you could do if you're interested in it. But um, in this case, right, there were 995 irrelevant variables. Um, you get the posterior inclusion, uh, inclusion probabilities, and it's maybe not so easy to see. But uh, the model correctly picked out the five. So there's variables one, two, three, four, five. Those are the only relevant ones. And it includes them in the model basically with probability one. Um, all the other variables have been eliminated, meaning that they're not used in the in the ensemble. 
right? So we can identify clearly which variables are relevant and which ones are um, are not. Um, so um, now we've tried this this methodology uh, on a lot of a lot of data sets um, you know, compared to a lot of different algorithms. Um, and essentially on all of the, um, so, so what's going on in here is there's, I think, about a dozen data sets. Um, and then we have uh, cross-validated estimates of the mean squared error. All of the responses for these data sets are continuous. So we looked at the mean squared error, uh, mean squared prediction error, um, but normalized everything by the performance of a baseline procedure. Um, so there's soft BART, that's the, the method that we're that, that we proposed and um, a cross-validated version of it. Um, but uh, the baseline is the cross-validated version. And, and essentially, if you have anything that has prediction performance bigger than one, it means that you lost to this procedure. If you have prediction performance less than one, it means that you that you beat the procedure. And the winning method is always in, in bold. So for the most part, either um, either soft BART or the cross-validated version of soft BART seem to, to do the best relative. These are all decision tree based um, decision tree based methods, um, including boosting and and random forests. There are a couple of problems where random forest does um, does better, but um, overall, actually, the method works very um, seems to work very well uh, on on the problems for which it can be uh, applied to. Um, Okay, so that's some uh, background in the methodology. And um, one of the contributions that we made was to develop some theory for understanding why these methods actually do better in practice. And um, before you know, jumping too much into the details, the, the short story is that um, when I have, or in the Zoom back here, if I have a function that can be represented additively, meaning that it's say f of x f one of x one plus f two of x two plus f three of say x three and x four, um, a nonlinear function where the interactions tend to be very uh, low order. So you think of your function of interest as being a function consisting pr primarily of main effects, and maybe with a couple of low order interactions. Um, then that's exactly the sort of structure that you would expect a decision tree or a sum of shallow decision trees to do a good job of picking up because most of the trees are um, are shallow, so they'll pick up main effects. And occasionally, they'll, you know, when you go to depth two, you're picking up a second uh, order interaction. Um, so the idea is that um, these functions should be the uh, should be good at picking up these, and, and you sort of expect these things to be. Representative of what you'll see in practice in, let's say, you know, social science or or medicine, um, you generally expect main effects primarily, and then maybe a small number of uh, second order interactions, very rarely third order interactions, and so forth. Um, if you if you buy this intuition, you should also expect them to not do particularly well when there are complicated interactions in the data. So for say image recognition, you wouldn't want to use something like this because they're, they're extremely complicated interactions between the variables. Um, but we developed some theory to kind of justify this, this intuition that we have. Um, uh, there are some conditions for establishing uh, rates of convergence of Bayesian non-parametric procedures. Um, they're somewhat technical, but um, Essentially, the first condition says that your prior has to put um, a lot of mass near the truth. So we're interested in, in estimating these things at a particular rate, epsilon n. This is sort of the convergence rate of the procedure. Uh, the first uh, condition basically says that you, your prior needs to assign sufficient mass to, to the ground truth, to neighborhoods of the ground truth. In this case, a neighborhood is a... a uh, particular type of kolbeck leibler uh, neighborhood. You have to be close in a kolbeck leibler sense to the truth. Um, and the second and third are in terms of um, 
essentially conditions on the size of the support of the prior. Um, they're formalized in terms of, of constructing sieves on the parameter space, but at a high level, what conditions two and three are saying is that um, the prior should not have too big of a support. If the support of the prior is too large in some sense, then it can mess with your convergence rate. Um, but if you check off conditions one, two, and three, then the rate of convergence that you'll get is, um, is this rate epsilon n. And you, you want essentially to get a rate epsilon n, which is as close as possible to, um, to, the, to the minimax rate. So for example, the minimax rate for estimating a, right, a, a, one, a twice differentiable function in one variable is n to the minus 2 fifths. Uh, in that case, the epsilon n that we were talking about would be uh, epsilon n is n to the minus two fifths. Um, okay. So we developed some tools for understanding these. These are essentially some technical tools for establishing conditions one, two, and three. The first is a a um, a small ball uh, probability. That's for a given function f naught if it is. Um, an alpha holder smooth function, which is d sparse, then we give this lower bound on the probability that you will be within delta of it. Um, so this type of condition is useful for checking that your function or your prior assigns uh, enough probability uh, to a neighborhood of the of the truth. So f naught is the truth, and so we want this prior probability of being close to it to be uh, to be big. Um, what does big mean? Well, it means bigger than bigger than this uh, this expression. Um, and we also developed a um, um, another uh, another tool, uh, which is qu uh, essentially quantifying the size of the support. So this is you know phrased in terms of, of entropy numbers, uh, log entropy numbers, um, and this is this is used essentially to build up our our um, our sieve, um, used to to check these two these two conditions um, uh, but using these these technical tools and if you're interested in 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 the theory I don't want to belabor the theory too much but if you're interested in it uh, well we have the paper in JRSSB and I'm also you know perfectly happy to, to talk about theory um, but using these you can prove um, some some uh, some rates of convergence and I'll talk about the rates of convergence for the particular problems um, in a second, or once I talk about the particular problems, I'll talk about the rates that you get out of them. Um, the first uh, that I'll talk about is density regression. Um, so uh, really what the, the focus on right now for this, this work is um, extending the semi-parametric results that we had to um, to fully non-parametric. So I'm saying the, the, the problems that we've looked at so far have just been semi-parametric in nature because of the Gaussian error, but maybe you want to, um, to loosen that uh, a little bit. So I might be interested in this generic model where my y just follows some unknown density, uh, f y given x, and um, I might be interested in this type of model for a variety of reasons. Um, I might be interested in the quantiles of y as a function of x, for example. Um, I might be interested in shape or skewness. Um, I might be interested in the number of modes, right? I, I'm, but I'm, I'm sort of interested in some features of y um, that I that I couldn't pick up from a semi-parametric Gaussian uh, Gaussian model. Um, at least in the Bayesian non-parametric literature, I think most of the attention for for this sort of problem has been uh, to use infinite mixture models. Um, so mixture models are very flexible, and so if you have an infinite number of them, uh, you'll, you'll get a very flexible model. Um, there's a variety, of, a variety of techniques that you can use to specify priors on these things. Um, uh, I think they, they became or started to become popular with the, uh, the work of, of Peter Mueller and David Dunson. Um, but uh, but the idea is to just mix essentially a bunch of, of linear regressions for y together and have the weights depend on uh, x. Uh, the reason that I don't like to use these things 
um, is that I, I find that it requires quite a bit of expertise to be able to use these things effectively. Um, I struggle a lot whenever I try to implement them because I really have no idea how to pick, um, pick the priors for these. And so it makes it a little bit inconvenient uh, to use them for, for non-experts. Um, uh, so the, the model that I, I used for this, uh, for this problem is a, um, a, um, a rejection sampling model where you take my density to be a baseline model. So think of this as the, the uh, model on which I want to center my my prior so as you know if you have if you're thinking in bayesian terms uh you often think of i have a prior that i would like to center at some particular value here you have a a density estimation model where you're interested in, in centering your your model at a a parametric family of distribution so maybe if i think that y given x is approximately normal maybe i pick h as a linear regression of uh, y on x um, so this is a parametric model that I think is a decent representation of the truth. And then I tilt the model by a, um, a non-parametric non function phi, um, phi of r and yx. And this is where my non-parametric modeling goes. And if this function r is very flexible, it turns out that um, this, will, this will give you a very flexible model. Um, this has been used a few times in, in the literature. So there's logistic Gaussian processes by, by Tokdar and others um, that takes the link, this phi, to be an exponential. And then there's the Gaussian process density sampler by, by Murray and others, which takes it to be a probit uh, function. And I'll, I'll use the, the probit, uh, probit link function. Um, the, the key observation for fitting these things is that you can sample from this model uh, using a rejection sampling algorithm. So this is getting a little bit into the weeds of how you implement uh, implement this model. Um, you, you basically end up using a data augmentation algorithm, which if you're a Bayesian, you're probably familiar with, um, you know, data, uh, using some data augmentation to simplify um, sampling from the posterior. Um, but by doing this, by, by making this observation that this density can be represented with a rejection sampling algorithm, um, you can augment data by filling in the, the latent rejections, essentially. Um, so a couple of possibilities for the baseline model that you might want to shrink towards. Um, you can shrink towards a parametric model, say a linear regression. Uh, that's a great choice. Or if you something that you can do in this case that I think um, people often don't do, but it's an, an interesting option to have, is you might think that your semi-parametric model is actually quite good, uh, but you want to, you're not quite so sure about the Gaussian errors, then what you can do is you can take the baseline model to be a BART and then kind of combine the two BART models together and, and shrink the model heavily towards the semi-parametric regression while allowing the model to adapt to additional um, complexities in the data. But they're both relatively straightforward to, to, to implement. Um, there's a data augmentation algorithm for fitting it. Um, I won't uh, go into to too much details, but you can just believe me that um, if, if you're sufficiently invested in BART to the point where you're at the point of implementing these things, this algorithm is, is very simple to, to, um, to implement. It's just a few lines. Um, um, so we, we tested this on, on a variety of, of problems. Um, uh, this is a problem due to, I think, uh, David Dunson uh, in one of his papers had this, um, had this problem. Mixture of two um, normal distributions not, uh, with nonlinearity in the mean and then nonlinearity and, and how the, the weights get mixed together. Um, the truth is in black here. And then we have a green dashed line for the 95% um, uh, pointwise uh, credible band. And the Bayes estimate is in this, this light blue. Um, it's a rejection sampling algorithm. And so you can ask how many rejected points that you have. Um, and roughly, we have. Um, 
rejections on the order of twice the the sample size, um, which is uh, not not too bad computationally. So rather than working essentially with 500 observations, really you're working with something like 1,500 observations, which isn't um, um, isn't a big deal for these these models. But um, you can also get the uh, recover the conditional density at specific values of x. Um, in this case, we had 20 variables. Only one of them was relevant. So you had 19 irrelevant variables and, and one relevant variable. So if I'm just looking at the density for that single relevant variable, uh, we do a pretty good job at, at capturing the, um, the, uh, uh, the true density. And you can see a variety of shapes are, are, are here, right? The, the conditional density goes from being unimodal to multimodal, uh, back to being unimodal again. So um, a lot of um, heterogeneity in, in the shapes. Um, there's more simulations. Um, and I, yeah, we'll, we'll probably can just skip the additional simulations. I mean, the, the, the ultimate story is that we do well in, in terms of estimating total variation distance um, across a bunch of different simulation scenarios. Um, our method uh, ends up doing very, um, very well relative to other Bayesian nonparametric and uh, tree-based methods for estimating, um, estimating conditional densities. And we even do pretty well for estimating quantiles in that we construct 95% credible intervals for conditional quantiles and get close to 95% um, covers. That was a uh, pretty nice surprise for us because we didn't have any uh, prior reason to expect that we would do good for this, but uh, actually we end up doing pretty well for quantiles uh, relative to competing procedures. Um, I'll do a quick application um, to this medical expenditure panel survey. Um, the code for fitting it is not too complicated. Again, again, if you just have the stuff, you plug in your um, plug in your. Um, in this case, there are two different design matrices because you have the baseline model and you have the um, the um, the tilting model or the rejection sampling model. Um, so you have two design matrices, but other than that, um, not too um, not too bad. Um, and you give some points at which you would like to predict the density, and you and um, the uh, a grid along which you want to predict the density. So you need to give uh, covariates you want to predict the density at, and then some uh, grid points. Um, I'll give you density anyway. This this data set is is uh, so the medical expenditure panel survey. Um, it's a longitudinal survey, or it's a, it's a regularly done survey um, in the US that uh, asks people, well, it, it surveys people about their, their usage of the medical system, how much they um, spend, uh, records a, a bunch of, of different um, features of, of, of an individual. So, you know, you get their, their age, sex, BMI, whether they smoke, um, you know, it, what diseases they have. And then, in, then you get their their medical expenditure out at the the back end. Um, uh, we were interested in looking at uh, the relationship between. Well, really, we were interested in looking at at the relationship between BMI and um, BMI is body mass index. It's a measure of um, essentially a measure of your your weight or whether you're overweight or not. Right, weight normalized by your height essentially, and. Um, and some variables, uh, but we picked up an interesting relationship between BMI and educa um, educational attainment. Um, going into this, well, we, we control for educational attainment. Uh, why am I? I think I froze. Can anyone, uh, can anyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but it is froze the 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 presentation. Yeah, the screen is frozen. I can't use my my keyboard. Ah. Me, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, there. No. <laughs> all right, all right. Sorry about that. Yeah, I don't know what that was. Um, all right. So we looked at. Uh, is this going to keep happening? 
All right, hopefully you're froze on the same screen I am, which is giving the, the density estimates. Um, but we picked up a, an interesting relationship between a BMI, so your weight, and education, uh, even after controlling. So going into this, I, I sort of assumed that the relationship between education and BMI would be um, moderated by your by your 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 income. That somehow the effect between education and BMI should only um, there shouldn't be any direct relationship between them. At least that's what I what I thought, perhaps naively. Um, but it it turns out that um, even after controlling for um, for weight, um, you uh, or sorry, even after controlling for 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 net income, um, you can pick up uh, an interesting relationship between BMI and education, um, and it's a it's interesting because it is not a big effect on the location. So changing your education. Uh, doesn't result in a location shift in the distribution, but it it rather it, it influences the tails of the distribution. So um, as I increase the level of education, um, I tend to have fewer outlying values. So I tend to have uh, fewer people who are highly obese or highly overweight. Um, the distribution becomes more peaked as you increase the level of of education. So. Um, overall, the mode doesn't actually move that much. Um, it's the, the 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 modal observation is is all roughly uh, around um, around zero. So the BMI was scaled to be uh, mean zero variance one. Um, the mode doesn't move too far off that. It does decrease a little bit, but the bulk of the of the change is in the tails of the of the distribution. So I think that's that's kind of interesting. Um, and I, yeah, uh, I probably don't have time to get too much into the hazard or survival ha uh, survival analysis stuff, but uh, the high level idea is that it's a, it's a similar trick of introducing a function uh, now to modify the hazard. Um, so survival modeling typically works in terms of a hazard function, and you take a baseline hazard for our model and you multiply it by this this non parametric piece that that modifies it. Um, uh, it's, it's, um, but the, the algorithm, the, the algorithm sort of develops very similar, uh, similar from there in that you do a data augmentation algorithm and you can do these interesting centering tricks again, where maybe you center on a, uh, semi-parametric Cox model, or you can center on an accelerated failure time model. Um, so you can do lots of interesting things like that. Um, and yeah, we we do pretty well in terms of um, comparisons to to alternate methods. We do we do quite well. Um, uh, mainly, we we compared to random survival forests, which is a random forest version of um, that's tailored to survival analysis, um, and picked up some interesting nonlinearities in. Um, uh, on this Mayo liver disease data set, which this one is publicly available. It's like it's built into the survival package in R, so everyone should uh, be able to get it. Um, and I'll wrap up just by mentioning what the, so I, I talked about the tools for establishing convergence, but uh, didn't actually talk about any results. Um, the game that you generally want to play with this is showing that the posterior distribution uh, contracts around the truth at some epsilon n, uh, where this B is describing a notion of neighborhood around the truth, um, and epsilon n is the convergence rate. So we're looking at the posterior convergence rate. And um, you can talk about the oracle rate, which is a rate that you would get if you knew exactly which variables were relevant and exactly how smooth the truth is. So you can't do better than the, the oracle rate is the, the idea. Um, so for example, the Oracle rate, let's say that I have 10, 10 variables, only one of them is relevant, and the function is twice differentiable, then the Oracle rate is gonna be n to the minus two fifths, because um, if I knew exactly which variable was relevant, then I would just be doing a univariate, um, a univariate non-parametric regression. Um, this notion of neighborhood is, is going to be some type of integrated Hellinger distance. Um, 
And uh, we're able to prove essentially that uh, Bayesian additive regression trees attain the oracle rate um, without requiring that you know the, um, the smoothness level or the relevant predictors. So this is the oracle rate for functions of this form that are D sparse and alpha smooth. Um, so this is the oracle rate. We get up to the oracle rate plus one piece, which is a log n term. Um, this is essentially a penalty for not knowing the smoothness. And then this other term here, which is a, a penalty for not knowing the um, which variables are relevant. It's a variable selection term. Um, so as long as p doesn't grow too fast, um, you get up to you, you get to the oracle rate up to a log n term. And you can even get consistency if p is growing uh, nearly exponentially fast. So you're allowed, th this accommodates the ultra high dimensional case where p is growing nearly exponentially in the, uh, in the sample size. You'll be able to adapt to that. Um, all right, I'll, I'll close here. Um, the main points that I want, you know, if you're, if you're taking away from this, um, is that both BART and the stuff that we proposed, which is called uh, SBART, they're very easy to use, and I would encourage you to give it a try in any problems that you're interested in. If you can use, you know, if you're doing a semi-parametric regression or something where the software exists, I'd encourage you to try it. Um, and I find them very useful for so uh, traditional Bayesian non-parametric biostatistic problems, um, which usually have been dominated by mixture models, and that things just just kind of work. Right, very little debugging is is required. Things just um, just work uh, and are are fairly robust. And then we also have some strong theory to to justify um, using them. Um, if if you're interested in in things with strong frequentist properties, um, now I have papers on my website. Uh, feel free to to look at. Not it's not quite up to date, unfortunately, but uh, my papers are there. Uh, including all the papers, I think all of them that I talked about uh, will be on there. If not, they'll, they're also on my Google Scholar. And um, yeah, I have software online. Um, this is the repository for the software uh, model. All right, that's all I wanted to talk about. So thanks again for inviting me. And uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. So thank you very much, Antonio, for your conference. Well, let began the, the questions. So maybe you could you raise your hand or write at the chat. Or maybe Xavi, who has switched on his mic, he wants to do the first one. Uh, thanks, uh, Antonio. It's very nice. I'm very, it's, it's uh, very interesting for, for me because uh, uh, usually, uh, I, 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 I take a look about the, the mixture models in, in biostatistic problems. Uh, a lot of problems that I try to solve is in, biosta in biostatistics. In your expertise, uh, the, uh, the computing concerns, the, the computing time or the difficulty in order to, to the computation is uh, better the BART or, or the mixture models? of the students easier because the, the people are more familiar with these techniques or you know there's not a lot of good i mean this is my my experience is that it's pretty hard to find good software for those infinite mixture models i mean um when i was comparing two mixture models so one of the models that is compared if you look at the simulation results is the probe at stick breaking process which was introduced by david dunson and, and one of his students and they have matlab code online uh, but there isn't much more than that um, there are a couple of other packages but none of them really implement the full model that's described by by uh by them um and so it's really like you're kind of on your own if you want to. At least that's my experience. If you want to do something, you're sort of left to your own devices. Um, so I mean, that's that, and that's a big overhead. You know, I mean, I would love for someone to to release software that made these mixture models very easy to use. I would probably use them a lot more. Um, so I think Bard is definitely easier to use. Uh, for computation, it should be faster to use BART. 
Um, now, the, the reality is that when I coded it, I didn't code it in a particularly efficient way. And because of that, it's, it's, if I'm being honest, it's slower than it needs to be. It's not as slow as the mixture models actually, but it is not, you know, it's not blazingly fast. A lot of the BART models are actually very fast. Um, there's a couple of packages that are, that are extremely fast for, for fitting uh, BART models. Um, now ours could be that fast, but you know, I, that, that, that's a lot more effort on my part. Um, now the, the main, I guess the, the main difficulty with these things is the mixing. The mixing is often not ideal. Um, the mixing is also not ideal for, for the mixture models either, but, um, yeah, I, if you have a lot of time to kill, you can run a very long chain and kind of get around it. I think it's, if you're patient enough to run a long chain, you know, you can get around these mixing issues and, um, for simulations, for whatever reason, actually they work pretty well with short, shorter chains than you might think. Um, so I ran maybe 4,000 or 8,000 iterations um, for the simulation. And then for the MEPS example, uh, because that's an actual problem that we were interested in, we ran a much longer chain just to be absolutely sure that it was, you know, that, that the results were um, not due to any poor mixing of the, of the Markov chain. Um, so yeah, I would say the speed is competitive with those uh, Bayesian non-parametric approaches and that there's scope for them to be faster. Okay, and, and in, in this time of the machine learning, deep learning, uh, what do you think is the, the engineers or computer science try to solve all of the problem with the neural networks? Uh, is the neural network Similar, better. Do you think that uh, your your models, because have a, a a big math under the model that the, we understand the, the the solution and neural network is more. Uh, how do you say, my friend? My friend say uh, a hammer, a hammer, a tall hammer. No, it's a, it's not find the prediction. Put in the in the hammer very strong and, and the prediction is good. No, what do you think about? This new uh, is the neural network deep learning solve all the problems and without uh, very big uh, math under the the models. I think so. Yeah, I mean the, the neural network thing is interesting because I think a lot of and especially students that come in with some experience with neural networks, they just want to throw a neural network at anything. And the reality is when is a neural network going to be good, right? The neural network is going to be good when you have very complex interactions in the data, right? They're awesome for, for image recognition or natural language processing or, um, yeah, or, or, um, or audio stuff, right? They're very good for those things. Um, but they're overkill for a lot of the problems that we're interested in where you really don't expect those high order interactions. And that's why, I mean, they don't, you know, they don't win Kaggle competitions on unstructured data for that, that reason, right? They aren't tuned to do those sorts of things. That's not to say that you can't, right? I mean, it, someone could come and, and try to construct a neural network that is designed to do the sorts of things that BART is good at. Um, but I don't know that there's any interest in it. Um, or, uh, on, on their end, I mean, I don't know if they're interested in making a neural network that's designed for social science problems. Um, so that, that's the first concept is that they're, they're not, they're not the best thing to use for a lot of, a lot of problems where you don't expect very, very complicated interactions, uh, in the data. And that's borne out. I mean, the, the neural networks have been tried. They were tried in the original BART paper. Um, you know, there's some comparisons to neural nets. Um, and they don't, I mean, they, they don't perform as, as well as you, as you might hope. Um, the other thing with neural networks is that the M, well, I, mean, I suppose this is true for BART as well, but, you know, we want uncertainty quantification out of these things. And you could, you know, if you want to do Bayesian inference for a neural network, you can, 
right? You can do some complicated Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, that's going to take uh, a lot longer to run than um, than our than 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 Bart. Like if you try to do HMC on these, it won't. Uh, um, it won't run in any kind of reasonable time. Maybe if you have a bunch of GPUs, it's not a problem. But uh, for for normal users, it, it's uh, not great. And then um, and there's one. Yeah, there was a, there was another point I wanted to make, but I I don't uh, I can't quite remember it. Um, the third the theory is actually so I I I went over some theory uh, for Bart. And I think you probably could prove similar things for one or two layer neural networks. Uh, Veronica Rokova has some papers that uh, actually does study um, the asymptotics of Bayesian neural networks and is able to prove you know, pretty good results for them. Uh, I think the, the theory with neural networks, uh, th this, this type of theory that I, that I go over is not that interesting for neural networks because the real thing that you want to be able to explain theoretically with for a neural network is why they work with very high dimensional problems with very high dimensional interactions and that still hasn't been explained but i think you probably could prove similar results to the ones that we prove um for for a neural network um yeah, I mean, sometimes like I see students that will say, "Well, I have a, you know, maybe they're they're taking a class and we look at a data set with like a hundred observations, and it's spatial and it has some dependency, and then they want to throw a neural network at it." And um, I I don't try to discourage them, but I I don't find those to be the best use of of that that technology. Um, Thanks. Uh... And I keep in, in, in contact in, in the future and uh, probably I'll write, I'll write some some questions about VAR because uh, we are interested in, in this technology. Anyone have questions? I think uh, they have no questions. Shall you want to say goodbye to Antonio? Well, thank you very much, Antonio.